It's Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, and it's election night in Delaware and across the United States. From Short Order Production House in downtown Wilmington, it's election night with the Delaware Democratic Party. With appearances by Senators Tom Carper and Chris Coons, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, Governor John Carney, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, and Newcastle County Executive Matt Meyer, along with candidates, activists, and party leaders from every county in the state. And now your hosts, Eric racer Schram, Jesse Chatterton, and Cassandra Marshall. Happy Election Night 2020, Delaware Democrats. My name is Jesse Chatterton. I'm the Executive Director of the State Party, and I'm so excited to be here tonight at Short Order Productions in Wilmington, Delaware, with our State Party Chair, Eric racer Schram, and our Wilmington City Chair, Cassandra Marshall, as we bring you two hours of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of everything Election Night here in Delaware. We've got some amazing candidates, some wonderful guests, some really critical and influential party stakeholders coming up uh, on the agenda tonight. But I think we've got to start um, on a somber note. Um, last night, as many of you are aware, um, our former elections commissioner, Elaine Manlove, um, was tragically uh, killed in a car accident. Um, she perished with her husband, Wayne. And all of us knew Elaine. We loved Elaine. She was a great partner um, in all that we did. Um, Eric, specifically as state party chair, worked very closely with Elaine over the years and uh, wanted to give him a chance to just share some reflections about Elaine. Thank you, Jesse. And again, um, thank you for having, you know, being with us this evening. Um, as Jesse mentioned, um, you know, the tragic loss of Elaine Lamanlev and her husband, um, it wasn't only a loss as a former elections commissioner. As many of you know that are watching this evening, you know, Elaine was a friend to all of us. She was a mentor to all of us. Um, as I said in my statement that I put out, her laughter was contagious and could, you know, diffuse any awkward situation, um, pass legislation on the floor, convince Democrats to talk to Republicans. Um, and this tragic news is devastating as it is. Um, you know, where I find solace tonight um, and, and, you know, give the condolences to her family is that, you know, she is watching over us. She is watching over this tremendous night. I could only imagine the text messages Elaine would be sending us to this at this point, knowing that, you know, the voter turnout surpassed half a million people. So again, we dedicate this show to Elaine, thinking of her and her husband, our thoughts and prayers are with her family. And let's carry uh, Elaine in our spirit and our heart as we go on this evening. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, and Elaine was really the architect of a lot of what happened tonight. Um, not not because you know she was a Democrat or Republican, but because she believed really deeply um, in making sure that every Delawarean had the opportunity to vote, um, and that voting was as accessible as possible. Um, so, from procuring um, new state-of-the-art voting machines to really pushing for democracy reforms, um, you know, tonight really is a tribute to her. And and we know that more than anything, she'd want us to be talking about um, the results. And, and the record turnout. And so without further ado, um, we're gonna pivot to that. And Cassandra, I mean, 500,000 plus voters in Delaware, the first time we've ever crossed the half million threshold, um, easily uh, shattering a turnout record. Um, just talk about that and what that means going forward. And that's really remarkable and just remarkable for Delaware and uh, a real testament to all of the work that, uh, that we've done up and down the state. Uh, during this time uh, of COVID, where we literally could not be together very often. Um, it was really hard for us to do the kind of campaigning that we traditionally do, knocking on doors, having meet and greets, you know, being in places where we can talk with our candidates and talk with one another. Um, and this, uh, this effort, a half a million people, more than a half a million people voting, you know, is a real testament to our candidates, a real testament to the party, a real testament to all of the work that went in to try to turn out and drive all of these voters to the polls. Uh, people uh, felt as though, um, and this is a testament, of course, to Mrs. Manlove, that people were really able to get their voices heard uh, and they were able to participate very easily in this election. So it's really a tremendous effort. And if I could uh, jump in there, as, as Cassandra's saying, you know, what, what we did as a Democratic Party this go around um, was really re-envision the coordinated campaign and mm -hmm. how do we actually talk to the voters on mm -hmm. the ground and use the absentee ballot vote by mail program. Um, and, you know, you'll hear a little bit more about the coordinated campaign later and we'll have Ed Friel here, who's one of our co-chairs. Um, but I think it's remarkable for the party for what they have done with that. Jesse? Well, without further ado, um, we're going to have plenty of time to talk tonight, but let's, uh, let's bring in our first uh, guest of the evening. Um, I, I think we can call him, uh, well, he's already a city councilman, but now he's been um, reelected uh, to a, his first full term uh, at, in city council. Chris Johnson, thank you, Chris, for joining us this evening. Good evening, y'all. 
Good Hi, evening. Chris. Thank you How for you having doing, me Chris? on. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, I hope you're, you know, on, on the verge of having uh, an exciting evening. Um, wanted to just, you know, ask you first and foremost, um, as, as, you know, we put this election behind us and look forward uh, to, to serving the people of Wilmington, what some of your priorities are, gonna, are going to be. The priority right now um, for the city, city honestly, is um, getting through the COVID crisis. Because um, unfortunately, um, because of the lack of, I, I think, uh, leadership at the federal level, um, they, you know, from the White House, um, city governments are going to be left struggling. So mm -hmm. looking at putting together at the beginning of year, next year's budget, um, it's going to be rough. Um, we're already having those talks and, you know, we're trying to preserve not only services, um, but hopefully, you know, uh, personnel will remain intact and we're going to have to make some tough decisions uh, going to 2021 budget. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens. So what do you think, Chris, in terms of, um, you know, the turnout uh, in the city, which looks like that may be record breaking as well, uh, you know, that that means for, you know, some of the direction for the city council over the next uh, couple of years? I think it really gives us a new direction. Um, because anytime you can turn it, turn, turn in new voters, you know, you can activate new voters. Um, we now have opportunity to keep them engaged, mm -hmm. you know, having them come to civic associations, having them come to city council meetings. So mm -hmm. um, I think we can't leave this as a wasted opportunity um, because we need everyone's help in, in Wilmington, especially to address, um, you know, the serious gun violence issues we have. Um, we're going to need to keep those folks engaged. So I think the Democratic Party, we have some great data, and uh, hopefully we can use that data to help folks get to meetings and really help us change Wilmington. Uh, Chris, just to follow up a little bit to that, you've kind of talked about your agenda. Um, obviously, you've talked about, you know, hearing from the ground up. When you were out at the polling places today, you know, were there one, two, three issues that you heard the most from the voters that were coming out? It was the top three issues, of course, in, in Wilmington, and being Wilmington is violence. You know, violence is number one. You know, folks want leaders who can will address violence. Um, and number two was was, was jobs. You know, um, jobs is something you hear about not only in Wilmington but statewide. And then three is housing, because um, in Wilmington we do still have affordable housing issues. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. it's greater than in other parts of the state. So um, that was probably the third most thing I heard at the polls. And uh, so I think as Democrats. Um, those areas should be in our wheelhouse. And as Democrats, we worked hard to integrate those as focuses in our uh, last platform that, uh, you know, um, Chairman uh, Razor Fan worked on, and I know all of you worked on, and we have a really good platform right. as, as Dell Dems. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, enjoy tonight. You. Um, we appreciate uh, you joining us quickly here. And, uh, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow the work starts. So uh, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Have a great evening. Have a great evening. Take care. You know, Cassandra, um, as city chair, you, uh, you know, you see sort of the city mobilize and come alive um, mm -hmm. around election time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, some folks may not know this, but Wilmington doesn't have off-year elections. Um, so all of its elections are, are in essentially in presidential years. Right. Um, and, and the primaries in Wilmington are mm -hmm. in, in oftentimes, um, you know, where where the election is decided. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about um, what it takes uh, for the city to come together and coalesce um, to, move, to move itself forward. Well, one of the things that's been really key for us has been, uh, you know, re-energizing our city committee and re-energizing our wards so that they are in neighborhoods, that they are in our communities, so that you can, so that uh, we have a lot of community people who are reaching out and talking to folks in the neighborhoods in order to make them, uh, in order to get them energized for voting. Um, the other key thing for us is, uh, has been the coordinated campaign. Uh, you know, we have uh, invested pretty heavily in the coordinated for the last two cycles, uh, which has been um, a very good investment on our part in terms of helping to turn out voters and helping to do that, you know, clearly across the entire city uh, to help us do some additional messaging and um, to be able to make sure that Democrats feel like they're being addressed and asked to vote every single cycle. Absolutely. Yeah, the work, the work you all are doing on the committee is critical and, and you know, our chairman talks about this a lot and he'll talk about it, uh, I'm sure, tonight. But, but the power flows from the bottom up in our party. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, you should really be commended for everything you're doing from a leadership perspective. Thank you. Um, speaking of leaders, um, we are really excited to welcome um, our county executive, Matt Meyer, who tonight was reelected to his uh, second term. Um, 
Matt did not um, have an opponent in the general election, um, but, but did win a primary uh, back in September. And uh, we're all really excited uh, to have him back. Um, he's really doing some wonderfully innovative things um, w with regard to COVID, um, with regard to um, helping unhoused Delawareans. And uh, Matt, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot, Jesse. They didn't tell me uh, I was talking to Jesse from 20 years ago. I didn't, I, I didn't think you were going to save for Joe Biden with our president. He got a haircut for the show. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're full of surprises here tonight. Um, hopefully we have a few more uh, coming down the pike. But, um, you know, obviously, Matt, what do you think? I mean, you were at a polling place this day. You were talking to voters. What do you think it was that galvanized so, so many people? First of all, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the people of Newcastle County, certainly the Democrats of the state, uh, Eric, you know, Cassandra, Dave Woodside at the county level, Kat Caudill, Lydia York, Frank Stevens, James Erickson, Lucretia Roberts, you, Jesse, uh, Cassandra, everyone in the party who's worked so hard, Christy Ionelli, to make today possible. There's a whole bunch of energy right now behind our party, uh, of course, nationally, but here in the state and the county and the city. And a lot of it is due to your tremendous hard work round the clock. I know for the past few weeks. So thank you for that. Matt, if, if you could tell us a little bit, um, you know, Jesse kind of started to ask, but when you were out at the polling places today, what, what were some of the things that you heard from people? Look, it, it, there's a lot of angst out there. There's a lot of angst about uh, what's going on nationally. The fact, you know, we're what, seven months into seven and a half months into a, a, a COVID pandemic, and there's no clear national strategy. There's a lot of interest in making sure state leaders local leaders, county, city leaders are taking COVID seriously, which I know I am in my offices. I know Governor Carney um, and, and, and uh, the various offices of state government are, and I know the mayors and municipal officials across the state are as well. So there's a lot of interest in making sure we're continuing to do that. And part of that is making sure we protect the most vulnerable, those small business owners who overnight in March, April, May, or even now in September, October, November, are seeing their businesses, multi-generational restaurants, hotels, catering companies disappear, making sure that we look out for them and take care of them. And we understand the longer this goes on, the more we have to do to take care of those most vulnerable populations. Absolutely. Cassandra? Thank you very much, Matt. Um, what do you think your, um, your top three priorities are going to be um, over the next few years as you're, as you're you know, stepping back into that role? You know, we, uh, in about mid-March, kind of threw away the whole playbook of what we were working on before mid-March, mm -hmm. and we're laser-focused on healthier communities, making sure, listen, we have federal money that we've used to make more broadly available testing mm -hmm. uh, than pretty much any county in the country, mm -hmm. and that expires December 30th. So mm -hmm. we're now working, trying to figure out how do we keep that critical testing element going past December 30th, so our community can be healthy. So that's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, is protecting the most vulnerable, making historic and courageous investments, like seeing new places that we can uh, have uh, transitional housing for homeless, treatment for the homeless, like we've proposed at the Wilmington South Sheridan. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first is healthy communities. Second is protecting the most vulnerable. And third is making sure we're doing everything to bring our economy back. I'm cognizant every morning, afternoon, and night that our unemployment rate is higher than it's been in generations. And we need to make sure we're doing everything possible to bring jobs back to the county. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. We know you're gonna, you and, and council are gonna work hard uh, in partnership on those issues. And uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have you. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot, Thank Matt. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're gonna transition straight into our next guest. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, this isn't only about highlighting our wonderful candidates. Um, but it's really about um, highlighting the entire democratic ecosystem and all of the amazing people who um, make it up. Um, and one of the core constituency groups of our party, our partners um, in all that we do, and, and you know, the people who share our values about working families is, is organized labor. Um, I wanna introduce Kat Caudill, who um, is with AFSCME, um, representing public employees, and also is the vice chair of the Newcastle County Party. Kat, thanks for joining us. Sorry about that. Kat, are you with us? I sure am. Hey, Kat, welcome. Hey, Kat. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Thanks We're so much good. for joining us. Absolutely. So listen, um, this was this was a monumental night, um, at least in terms of turnout. I think we're still awaiting um, a number of down ballot results. But talk a little bit about what was at stake um, for, for AFSCME and for organized labor writ large. 
Uh, so I know that throughout the campaign, we hear about everything that's on the ballot. Um, and for organized labor, what was on the ballot this year was workers' rights. And while getting Joe Biden elected would have is was is our priority. Um, it was also a priority to make sure uh, that we got people elected down ballot who also believed that workers' rights uh, needed to be preserved and expanded um, and not continue to erode those rights um, as we continue to move on. So workers' rights is definitely the top uh, ballot issue that was that was there for organized labor. Kat, um, one of the things that's uh, 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 sort of unique to Delaware actually is the really close partnership between the Delaware Democratic Party and labor. Um, how do you see that evolving over the next couple of years? I think that uh, you're absolutely right first, uh, Cassandra, that it is one of the most unique things that we have going on here in Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, I've had the pleasure to work in several other states with other organized labor and there is no other relationship than the Delaware Democratic Party and organized labor. Uh, I think what we need to work on as we move forward is making sure that we understand that labor isn't a monolithic, we don't have just one issue right. um, and our members don't just have one issue. Um, and making sure that we continue to work with uh, our our members and the party and making sure that our members' voices are being heard at all levels of government. Great, Kat. If you could, you know, obviously you wear the hat as vice chair of the party. You know, we have you here as organized labor tonight. Um, I've worked with you for years on statewide campaigns, mm -hmm. on the coordinated campaign. You know, what's your biggest takeaway from today? Like what, 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 what rises to the level that will be memorable for you? For me, it was arriving at my home polling place. I, on doctor's orders, was not allowed to vote in person this year. So I voted uh, by mail. And I went to my polling place, arrived at the same time I would have arrived when I vote in person. And the line was all the way to the road. Right. And then went and visited all the other um, polling places in my district and then outside my district because we had uh, put members and volunteers with other candidates and then came back in the line, different people, but the line was still the same length. And I know that some of that is because we're social distancing, but a lot of that is because people are excited and people are, are ready for their voices to be heard. Right. And I think that that is the thing that I will uh, remember the most from today. It was very similar, you know, down in my neck of the woods where I live in Townsend, um, you know, the Townsend Fire Department, the Blackbird Community Center, um, you know, where I voted, the Townsend Early Learning Center. It was just, you, it was mind blowing to see the lines. Um, and again, it, to me, you know, obviously it's, it's important for voter turnout um, in our party, I should say, but it was just to see people participating. Mm -hmm. So Jesse, Absolutely. back to you. Well, Kat, thanks so much for joining us. Um, but more than that, thanks for all you do for the party um, and for working people up and down our state. Um, you know, from ASME to the AFL-CIO to DSEA um, to IBEW, to, to all of the groups who are, are really on the front lines fighting for workers, um, we hope that we're um, doing our part as partners and uh, we can't wait to work with you on the issues that matter to working families uh, over the next few years. Here's to 2021, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Thank you. Uh, um, so next up, um, we've got someone who I'm really excited to introduce, um, uh, Sarah Stowens for Moms Demand Action. Um, anyone who um, has been following democratic politics over the last few years, not just here in Delaware, but all across the country, knows what a force um, the, the red shirts have become. And um, they, uh, they are difference makers on the ground here in Delaware. There's just no doubt about it. Um, I'm really excited because Sarah has become not just an ally of the party, but a, a really close friend over the years. And um, the work that they do, both um, on issue advocacy, on gun safety, um, urban guns, urban gun violence, um, you know, mass shootings, et cetera, um, to really um, drill down on, on the common sense reforms we can make to make our community safer is, is extraordinary. And, um, and now over the last several weeks, the work they've done on the ground to help elect gun sense candidates has been um, unmatched. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Sarah, can you hear us tonight? 
looks like we're having some audio problems. We'll try to get Sarah up here just uh, in just a second. But um, Eric, you know, we've uh, we've worked with with moms. We've worked with every town quite a bit. Um, they've been really good partners. They've been very supportive of what we do as a party. Um, just talk a little bit about um, kind of their ground game and, and what a difference they made uh, in this election. Yeah, you know, I, I go back actually two or three years ago, and I and I remember, you know, when moms first showed up, right, at Legislative Hall, they first started showing up at, at party meetings. And, and what you heard was, oh, that's great, but they have seven or eight folks. Um, and when Sarah, who, you know, will be on with us pretty soon here, and the rest of that group were given the marching orders by, by key folks, you know, at Legislative Hall, um, show up in numbers, show mm -hmm. us that you actually mean something. Um, you know, not only did they start showing up in numbers at Lake Hall, they strategically started coming on Democratic committees. They started showing up at our meetings. Um, and, and, and then here we are in 2020, right? And as Jesse said, you know, the red shirts are everywhere. Anytime anybody in Delaware is following Delaware politics, you're, you're following um, social media, um, you know, you will see the presence of the moms. Uh, Jesse, back to you. Well, and Cassandra, I mean, just to talk a little bit more about the gun violence issue specifically, I think one of the things that's, that's so unique about the moms and so important is, um, you know, a lot of times we tend to fixate on this, the sensational, mm -hmm. you know, the mass shootings in schools and, and places of worship. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're right here in a city where um, it's scarred by gun violence every day. Absolutely. And I think the moms do a really wonderful job of not losing sight of that and um, maybe making that a, as much a priority as anything. They, uh, they are definitely here with us in the city. You know, they've been engaged with a lot of marches, a lot of meetings, a lot of planning around, you know, helping to deal with, you know, some of the gun violence issues here in the city. Uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to them expanding some of their presence here. Um, I know that, you know, up and down the state, you know, they have been key to some of the election of uh, of a number of our newer legislators, um, and they've provided incredible support on the ground, phone banking, you know, all the kinds of things that are valuable to a campaign, uh, and all the kinds of things that a campaign is, you know, uh, uh, going to be able to, um, you know, needs to survive. Uh, and we're definitely looking for them to, you know, expand some of their presence here in Wilmington uh, and to help us get organized and to help us get more gun sense candidates. Um, not that, you know, Wilmington has a lot of oversight over uh, guns and and the use of them here, um, but we definitely want to be supportive of uh, whatever legislation is happening in Dover, um, because we know um, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you know that gun violence uh, needs to come to an end here, and we need to be able to to control some of the guns that are coming into the city. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we should take a moment to just um, you know do a little bit of a deep dive, or sorry, a shallow dive, I should say into uh, some of the data we're seeing uh, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, right now, about 30% of the vote has been reported across 170 precincts. So we're still um, a ways away from, from certainly being able to call a number of the down ballot races. Um, but to see Joe Biden and, and uh, Senator Harris, um, you know, at 70% um, or, or nearing 70%, I think is, is remarkable. Um, obviously, you know, Joe's a hometown hero for us and, mm -hmm. and he was always gonna perform really well. Um, but I think this, you know, this is this is a really impressive margin. You know, you don't usually see this type of margin in a presidential race where party ideology is and tribalism is so is so significant. Mm -hmm. And I also think that, you know, as you start taking a look at some of the down ballot rates, races as well, you know, certainly, you know, our Senator Chris Coons is doing incredibly well, you know, against uh, a field of uh, of competitors, you know, um, uh, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester has been doing really well. Uh, you, you know, I think it, this is real testimony to all of our voters who were, um, you know, very energized not just to come out for Joe Biden, but also to come out and to vote for legislators who are working for them already and doing a great job. Yeah, and diving a little bit deeper, I'd even point out, um, you know, what is fascinating to me as you look at these numbers is is the vote by mail, um, the absentee ballots, mm -hmm. right? You know, we as a party, you know, we talked about earlier, the coordinated, we re-envisioned that. And how do we as a party own talking to those voters? How do you safely vote? And if you look at, you know, I can almost say with 100% certainty, maybe you know 98% certainty, that we won all the races by absentee ballot at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, what we're now waiting is for the turnout. But if you look at the primary and what happened versus the general, um, you know I was very concerned that the 
you know, the Republicans would come out more um, for the primary, and we still outperform them in the primary. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. that trend can continue here, you know, we have many races that, you know, some of the races that, you know, we obviously were focused on as a party, others would have maybe said they weren't in play, could be in play this evening. Um, Absolutely. And that's what I really see as you start to, to see some of these vote machine numbers coming in. Um, Jesse? Yeah, and then I'm drilling down um, as, um, you know, as I think we, we work to get our next guest up on, on some of these local races. Um, so I'm looking at the state Senate. Um, very few machine votes in, but, you know, in fact, let's see, an SD5, um, sorry, an SD7, yeah, SD5, I'm sorry, we're looking at um, about a 3,000 vote lead for Kyle Evans Gay over Kathy Cloutier. Um, anyone who's been following, you know, the party and kind of what we, where we've been trying to prioritize things, um, that that race has been uh, a really key for us, and it's exciting to see um, them performing really well. Um, over in Senate District 7, where we've got um, Spiros Mancivinos running against Anthony Del Colo. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Del Colo, um, you know, was a, won a really impressive um, race two, four years ago, um, very narrowly in a district that um, has traditionally been Democratic. Mm -hmm. Spiros stepped up, ran um, a really strong campaign, um, was very competitive and looks to be up um, 2,000 votes, obviously, with, with a number of votes outstanding. So um, we expect it, again, as Eric said, we need to be cautious. We expect it to have a, a significant lead um, after absentee votes were counted. Right. That's the case here. Um, machine votes are literally dead even. So, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to monitor this over the next 90 minutes um, yeah. and, and other races like it to, to see where this lands. Yeah, and just looking a little further south, if you go the, below the canal, again, um, State Representative District 9, um, you know, it is also, you, you look at, you know, as Jesse just said, the vote by mail, um, but the first machines that came in, you still have Debbie Harrington, you know, definitely, you know, in play there. So I think this evening is just going to show you, and, and we kind of went through this on primary night, you know, as we all continue to hit refresh um, with the Department of Elections website, um, you know, there's a lot of races that are still on the table here. And, uh, you know, I, I can't go back enough, and Jesse mentioned how I often say the power flows from the bottom up, and, and we started this process, the reality is, two years ago. Um, you recruit good candidates. You, you leveled the playing field and make it even for everyone. You know, did we have some aggressive primaries? Absolutely. Um, but the reality is we got brand new people involved in these campaigns. And what does that mean is you have all those new people that came in through these primaries that are now volunteers that are helping get the numbers to be where they are tonight that you see so far. Absolutely. And so, um, Cassandra, just, just mm -hmm. real quick to finish your thought. Um, wanted to talk one, about one other city race before we bring up our next guest. Because okay. um, there was one other competitive race um, where, where we had an, a, an opponent for one of our incumbents, and that was um, in the fifth ward, um, Brigida Fields against Alexander Hackett. Right. Um, you know, there was a lot of chatter around this race because we saw, we, we usually don't see independent party candidates being so active. Right. Um, and in this case, we had a, a very active independent party candidate. Um, but I think, you know, what we see here uh, so far is that, um, you know, very few votes are in, but Brigida is really performing quite strongly. She's performing very, very strongly. And, you know, Brigida um, would be a new candidate. She's, she's definitely not an incumbent, but, you know, she is certainly a native West Sider uh, and has, you know, run a very strong campaign, you know, working and talking to so very many people. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, for an outsider to, you know, to, um, you know, to be people who actually live in their, in their own districts um, and who have that district in mind. So, you know, we're, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see how well she's going so far. And you know, we're looking to make sure that that keeps up for the evening. Well, we promise to keep you posted on results as they come in. Uh, we were happy to be able to provide a brief update. I know everyone at home is hitting refresh even more fervently than we are. <laughs> yes. Um, but now um, I want to transition to um, our next guest, um, a familiar face to many of you. He's our former DENREC secretary, um, just an incredibly active um, and thoughtful surrogate for the Biden campaign. Um, Colin O'Mara. Colin, are you with us? Hey, everybody. Hey, it's good to, good to see all of you. I'm actually, I just, just got back from West Philly uh, a few minutes ago, so I'm at the uh, office down at the riverfront before, before this night's festivities. Thank you uh -huh. for joining us, Colin. Yeah, we know it's a busy night and there's a lot going on and uh, a really important thing going on down at the riverfront, so we appreciate you giving us just a few minutes. Absolutely. Um, look, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen in the race for the White House just yet, um, but we know who Joe is um, and we know what he stands for and we know who you are and the things that you care about. Just talk a little bit about um, what a Biden presidency would mean um, um, for our planet. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, this isn't one of those elections where there's a slight difference between the candidates, right? We've lived through four years of hell with a president that denied that climate science exists, um, did everything he could to erode basic protection for the air we breathe and the water we drink. Mm -hmm. And to do that and to have another four years of that would be absolutely, absolutely just devastating for the uh, for the country. And so, like, I mean, we are behind the eight ball. I mean, in Delaware alone, right, we're the lowest flying state in the country. We are one of the states that's going to be most impacted by climate change. And so to have a leader that, you know, and Donald Trump that denies the science and refuses to take action, if anything moves us backwards, is a disaster. Where, and the, the contrast is that Joe Biden is, has put forward the most progressive environmental policy platform in our nation's history. The climate plan is brilliant. It includes all kinds of investments around environmental justice, investments in jobs, good jobs, and clean energy and, and natural resource re restoration. Um, it really is going to be transforming. And frankly, I think for Delaware, um, it could help create thousands of jobs um, that we're going to desperately need as we're coming out of this, this recession. So from an environmental point of view, it was an absolute home run. And this is why, you know, 80, 90, 80 to 90% of folks that voted on the environment voted for Joe Biden today across, across the country. And one of the real key things I think about, you know, about people who are voting for the environment is that, you know, you get a twofer here, right? You also get a lot of economic development around that. And, you know, one of the keys, particularly for the United States of America, is to stay on top of this kind of economic development. You know, we do not want to lose, you know, the technological edge um, or, you know, some of the thinking edge around this type uh, of the, the solutions that we need in order to address this type of, um, of global warming. Um, and, you know, we don't want to lose that to China. We don't want to lose it to Germany. We don't want to lose it to the world. And we need a president like Biden to be able to, you know, get us back to that kind of leadership. Yeah, Cassandra, you're exactly right. And, and look, I mean, the vice president says it perfectly, right? When he, see, when he hears climate change, he thinks God. Mm -hmm. right? when, when Donald Trump hears climate change, he thinks hoax. Mm -hmm. And look, and I'm tired of living in a world where we're allowing solar panels to be made in China, electric vehicles to be made in Japan, offshore wind turbines to be made in Germany. I want that all made right here. I want right. it made in Delaware. I want it made in the U.S. Right. And frankly, you know this better than anybody else, Cassandra. I mean, all your work for all those years cleaning up brownfields and all the jobs and opportunity created, this is not the normal economy versus the environment. Good environmental policy and climate will be the economic engine of the 21st century. The countries that ad adapt early are going to create millions of jobs. The countries that don't are going to be importing importing products from places right. that do. So this right. is an absolute no-brainer for, uh, for Delaware. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Colin, you, you mentioned, and we know that you have been a surrogate for VP Biden. You just came down from Philadelphia. As you've been traveling around the country and, and being a surrogate and talking to the voters, you know, obviously VP Biden has this phenomenal policy, you know, the, the stuff that you're doing. What are you hearing from the voters as it relates to that? Yeah, look, I, I think the thing, and thanks, Eric, for the question. I mean, I, I think that the thing that most folks are most excited about is that he has a policy kind of agenda across the board that's going to address the four historical crises that we're in right now, right? The pandemic, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, and the racial injustice crisis, and, and this intersectionality, right? Of this, right. like what I'm hearing from folks when, I, when I'm talking to folks in Ohio or in Michigan or, you know, down in Florida, which I'm not, not, not thrilled with Florida, but ha pretty happy everywhere else right now, is that folks are looking for jobs, right? I mean, we're going to have probably 20% of the, of, the, of, the, of, of Americans under 30 unemployed coming out of this pandemic. We're mm -hmm. going to need to put folks to work in, at big numbers. That's why the Civilian Climate Corps that the Vice President's been talk talking about is so important, because we're going to find jobs for young folks of all backgrounds and all types of communities across the country. And so I, I think it's the economic message that has been winning people over. And, and it's crazy because what I'm seeing on the ground is that folks want hope that we're going to actually invest in this country, we're going to build things in this country, that we're actually going to have a, you know, kind of build back better. Right. Vice President, bringing those voters all across the country. Awesome, thank you, Colin. I, I, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, the the Vice President and uh, the presidential race here, um, but you're a creature of Delaware politics. Um, I'm sure you've been following races down ballot um, closely. What sticks out to you so far tonight? Yeah, look, I mean, so I was in, I was voting this morning at the Emanuel Church up around the 17th. And Cassandra, I got to tell you, at least three people in my line had the lit drop that we dropped yesterday in their hand as they were walking into the polling booth. That's great. So I think that drop was very effective in the city yesterday. That's great. Um, I'm really excited, right? I mean, we have a Democratic Party where you have environmental ch champions across the board. I mean, if we flip the fifth, if Kyle's elected, uh, she's going to be an incredible champion. Sarah McBride's an incredible champion um, for, for environmental environmental justice. I'm really excited about, about Marie. I'm really excited about Ray. I mean, there's really talented folks that are on the ballot um, that are, are going to be just great members of the legislature. And, and frankly, some of the big things I care about, you know, 
more doing more on clean energy, doing more hopefully on clean water. These are things that have gotten gotten a stall the last few years. And so you know, when I see so many folks lining up, I was down in Apo this morning, I'm um, just looking at the turnout and like folks were around the block and around the, around the school, I mean, both the elementary school and the high school there waiting to vote. And I was just talking to some folks saying, you know, what are some of the things? And they all want to talk about jobs. They all want to talk about Trump, but you know, the environment and kind of clean water and clean air was near the top of their list. And so mm -hmm. I, think this, I think the combination of young progressives coming into the legislature is huge. I think having leaders at the national level, like Senator Coons and Senator and, and Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, get you know seventy percent of the vote is absolutely gigantic. But I like that in Delaware, like you can't be a, a strong Democrat unless you're a strong environmental champion, and that's a pretty great place for us to be. Yeah, absolutely. Colin, thanks so much for joining us uh, tonight. Um, go enjoy uh, the the revelry down at the riverfront. Um, you couldn't have set us up for a better transition talking about environmental stewards um, than our next guest, Senator Carper. Um, Senator Carper, uh, for folks who don't know, is, uh, has been serving on the Environmental and Public Works Committee for some time uh, down in Washington. Um, but when he's not in Washington and he's here at home, he's one of the most staunch Democrats and most impressive party builders that we have. Um, he's going to be joining us in just a second. Um, he wasn't on the ballot this year, Eric, but um, I, you know, I think it's worth talking a little bit about his contributions to our party absolutely um, and, and how he's helped really helped lift us all up yeah and i look back at my history being involved in the delaware democratic party for the last 18 years and and there is nobody who has done more for the party and again senator carper represents us well in washington but you talk about somebody who contributes to the party the infrastructure knowing and believing what i have said what former chairman Danello taught me that power flows from the bottom up um you know who literally is always involved at the coordinated gets their funding in early on um Along with Senator Carper, too, and you'll hear from him later this evening, we've always been so fortunate to have Ed Friel. Um, and it, it's kind of a package deal that we get with Senator Carper, um, which, is, which is phenomenal. We get him to represent us in D.C. We get him to help us you know, have the infrastructure and resources of the party. And then you know, we get his personal, closest personal friend and also you know, political ally and uh, advisor, Ed Friel, which has been which has been uh, absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, what I also remember with Senator Carper is, you know, back to the years when, you know, those of you watching tonight might not remember, but if you look back 10, 15, you know, 18 years ago, we used to have to beg people to run for office. So what does that mean? You know, we'd, we'd put together a candidate recruitment panel and, you know, we'd, we'd have to offer them things. We'd have to talk about the numbers. We'd have to talk about, you know, investing in their campaign. And the first person always at that table for us was Senator Carper Jesse. And, and again, that's just one of the things that, you know, I, you know, obviously he's doing a phenomenal job for us in the Senate, um, but I have always seen, and the first thing I think of when I think of Senator Carper is his investment in our party. Yeah, Cassandra. I mean, y you can speak to this as well. Um, it, it's been it was a weird election cycle for so many of us, um, dealing with uh, dealing with COVID, um, dealing with um, really reimagining the way we campaigned. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've got to think for Senator Carper, um, it was maybe a bigger adjustment for anyone, given his affinity for retail politics. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure he was stir crazy uh, some of these weekends trying to figure out, um, you know whether there was a, a canvas to be had or, or a, you know, a grocery store to, to shake hands out front of. Right. Um, j just talk a little bit about uh, Cassandra, his, um, you know, he's a Wilmington resident, his, his commitment to the city, uh, to the city party um, and to really building, building us up here. Well, certainly, you know, his commitment to the city party has been really fantastic over the past few years that I've been chair. Um, every time that we have an event, you know, he's one of the first people to sign up. You know, he helps invest in uh, in the city party as much as possible. But m more than anything, and I think that this happens all the way across the state, you know, he's a great mentor for, uh, for candidates that are trying to run. You know, it seems as though, you know, he might be a little too busy to do that kind of mentor and to take that kind of personal care with candidates. Um, but you do find that, that he is definitely engaged in all of these campaigns. Um, and, uh, and this past Monday, uh, we did a large lit drop for Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long here in the city. Uh, and we had a lot of people who turned out, which was really gratifying. Um, but so did Senator Carper. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you could tell from Senator Carper and from a lot of people was that he hadn't seen uh, a lot, that kind of campaign activity, a formal lit drop for a while. So he was really excited to see it and really excited to help us get that going. Great. And we're going to have Senator Carper joining us in just a second. My understanding is he's, uh, he's sitting down and getting mic'd up uh, down at the riverfront. Um, it sounds like we do have Sarah Stowens from Moms Demand Action back. Is that, is that right? Is Sarah with us? 
Can you hear me? Sarah, can you hear us? Sarah. Hey, Sarah, we have you. There you ah, are. I can hear you. How are you? We're doing okay. We're sweating under the hot lights. How are you doing? <laughs> I am great. I am, you know, listening to all the awesome numbers rolling in and getting really excited for what is to come. Well, for those who, um, you know, either either tuned out or, or have short memories, uh, Sarah <laughs> is the chapter lead here in Delaware uh, of Moms is a Man Action and has done amazing work on the ground uh, in, in, in fighting uh, gun violence and, and advocating for gun sense candidates. Um, Sarah, are there are there a couple races that you guys are really um, excited about tonight? Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to play favorites. We have 25 really amazing candidates that we're working with statewide. Um, everyone from the, the senator who just won, right? We just um, learned that Senator Coons re was reelected um, to all the state Senate and state rep races that we're following along with. So, um, you know, we're just really excited. We also were so excited to learn that Sarah McBride won, um, really waiting on some other new exciting candidates to be called like Kyle Evans Gay, Spiros Mancavinos, um, Stephanie Berry, I can brush on and on. We're really excited about Marie Pinckney. So um, it's going to be a really awesome night for Delaware and an awesome night for Gun Sense. It is going to be an awesome night for Gun Sense, and you know we were talking a little earlier about you know the contribution of your group, um, you know to helping to invest in our candidates and helping to invest in candidates that are going to pay attention to the problem of violence on our streets, the problem mm -hmm. of you know guns that are just awash in some parts of the state here. Um, what do you think is um, you know, or I should say, you know. As you were wandering around here, um, the state today, to various polling places, you know, what is it that you heard from people um, about violence, and you know, what it was that they were looking in terms of solutions? You know, what I think I hear over and over again is just an overwhelming majority of people who um, agree with our legislation and who are just excited to know that we are doing everything we can to elect people who are going to work hard to enact common sense legislation like an assault weapons ban, like mm -hmm. a permitting bill or a licensing bill to really, you know, respect the second amendment while also understanding that we need to put in place restrictions that help us be a safer community. Right. Um, Sarah, I was talking a little bit earlier, um, you know, about when you first came on deck and when I first met you and you were getting involved and you were, you know, provided the very clear orders like, you know, the seven or eight of you is great, but show up with larger groups of moms. Show, show us more red, right? If you can just, you know, quickly tell us how you guys did that. Because as I was mentioning earlier, you know, anytime you go on social media now in Delaware, if you look at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, you guys were an army in all of these races. And how did you turn that group of seven or eight into that army? Well, thank you so much for saying that. Um, I think that the way that you do it is the way that we as moms do most of the things we do. We build relationships and we talk to people and we bring people along just to make sure that everybody is well fed. Um, and, you know, that's the way, but I think it also comes back to the numbers are just on our side. And okay. yes, I heard that people want to see more red shirts in legislative hall. But I think what also we proved in 2018 and we are doubling down on in 2020 is that voters are are demonstrating right. at the polls. They demonstrated in 2018 with the transition from regular health to a surgeon and others. Mm -hmm. and now they're demonstrating again. They are screaming out loud that they want gun sense in their legislative legislative bodies um and that's what that's what we're show, showing over and over again right so. well sarah um thank you so much for all you do for um not only the party but for the cause uh, a cause that's really important to all of us absolutely um and thanks for being um i'll take a moment of personal privilege such a good friend and confidant and someone that um you know it's just really important in my life so um it was great to talk to you i can't wait to to talk to you after after all this is over have a good thank evening you. sarah thank you thanks sarah Great night.
Thanks. Um, we're going to transition right away into um, someone who needs no introduction, but who we just introduced before Sarah came on, um, <laughs> and that is uh, that is our, our senior senator, Senator Carper. Um, senator, uh, you were not on the ballot tonight, but um, there is no real uh, election year off for you. Um, talk a little bit about what you were up to today and uh, how you're feeling tonight. Are that's me? How am I feeling tonight? How are you feeling are you tonight? Feeling? Hopeful. Hopeful. But um, it's still early. I uh, was campaigning this, but I've been campaigning up and down the state uh, today for folks that are running, for the most part, for local offices, uh, some statewide, but mostly uh, uh, state representative, state uh, senate races. And uh, early one of my first stops this morning, I think it was Mount Pleasant Elementary School, and, uh, a, a longtime friend came up and she said, uh, I found this uh, Joe Biden button. And it's Joe Biden, uh, presidential button for 1988. And uh, that's uh, the first of three uh, attempts. My mother used to say that uh, uh, she had she, was, uh, she used to say that uh, things happen in threes, and she'd also say the third time is a charm. Uh, I told Joe when he was thinking about running again. I said, "Well, my mom used to say Joe used to say third time is the charm, and this would be the third time for you." And uh, so we're encouraged. Uh, we're looking at the races. Some interesting uh, races going on right now. North Carolina razor thin for president of uh, uh, Texas. I'll raise it then. If Joe wins both of those, game over. And uh, Trump, it looks, it looks like he's taken uh, uh, Florida, but the, which is not a huge surprise, at least for, for, I think for most of us. But uh, we still got Pennsylvania and uh, we still have uh, Wisconsin. So I'm feeling very good about Joe. But yeah, the Senate races, the Senate races from a lot of them, Chris Coons has won, won clearly. Uh, LBR, at least what Rochester's going to win by, by, uh, by a lot. Uh, a number of our other uh, Senate colleagues are going to win. We've uh, flipped uh, the seat in uh, in Colorado, and former Governor Hickenlooper has uh, defeated the incumbent, Cory Gardner. Uh, we have uh, close races in Montana. We have close races in in uh, Arizona, and we'll just see uh, we'll see what happens as the uh, the night uh, the night goes on. Calling me hopeful, but uh, still not uh, not uh, never like wildly optimistic until we had a chance to count uh, all the votes count all the votes. Absolutely. Um, I know that you were uh, traveling up and down the state today, uh, talking to a lot of voters at polls, talking to a lot of our candidates. You know, what did you what did you hear today as, as some of the most important things that people were interested in, um, some of the most important concerns from people from your travels um, today? Well, you're, you're not going to believe this, but for the most part, where people are coming in and out of polling places, they want to get in and they want to get out. Mm -hmm. They don't want to spend a lot of time talking. I've got a lot of candidates there, folks who are happening in candidates. You know, most people, uh, most voters just want to avoid the, you know, the crowd and just get in and out. For, for the most part, the conversation today in, in these polling places was uh, for us to say, you know, thank you for coming. Mention the name of the person that, that I'm campaigning with and asking to support them. And um, but for the most part, uh, issues uh, at that point in, in the game are, are frankly not discussed a whole lot. I'm not, if I if I uh, just if I could judge for just a very small uh, sample, uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare, healthcare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Senator, before you got on and we were doing the introduction, you know, I talked about, um, you know, how what an important role you've played in the Delaware Democratic Party and um, realizing, you know, investment from the bottom up and, and getting people